Hello my loves and welcome to yet another episode of Strange Playground. Sort of humming and hawing about what the topic of this uh, particular video is going to be because I've got so much to talk about. Um, I've been on a sort of hiatus of late for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, personal reasons and whatnot. Just haven't had the energy to do it. I've been rebuilding and refortifying my energies. We'll be getting back onto a more um, varied and... Uh, regular production cycle very soon we've got a lot coming up actually um my colleagues from the not the same log podcast where we talk about various forms various different examples of horror uh in tv cinema and other mediums as well um elliot chapman and jack graham we have a couple of things in the works we've got several episodes of uh not the same log mooted and we're going to be doing a little bit of a shift in that regard we're going to be um doing uh, just branching out into other types of films not just ex almost exclusively horror based we're going to be doing other things as well um related thematically um but not in the same not necessarily the same genre one of the things we are looking at is moving into Harryhausen films for example the Ray Harryhausen milieu we, lo we all love those films we all have a, an incredible passion for those films and um yeah, talking about them is going to be a lot of fun. We were thinking of starting with Clash of the Titans. I have no doubt if we do Clash of the Titans, we'll probably move into Jason and the Argonauts and the Sinbad films and various, various other examples because it's the natural thing to do. Uh, we're also talking about doing a prolonged series uh, based on the TV show Hannibal so keep an eye out for that definitely keep an eye out for that also there's going to be more stuff with my colleague kit power for um what the hell is wrong with us again loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff for that one i mean one of them i was thinking of doing with kit but i don't know whether i'm going to do it here um on uh, sort of just in strange playgrounds we were thinking of doing that net the the recent netflix documentary about jimmy savile um it's a problematic one, that one, because it is it is going to be a wholly negative podcast. We usually do things that we like. It's very rare that we do um, in What the Hell is Wrong With Us things that we don't like or things that we're not ecstatic about. I mean, for the most part, What the Hell is Wrong With Us is stuff that we just efflores about. We just cannot help it, you know? It's, it's, it's Weave World, it's Imagica, it's It, it's Clive Barker, it's Stephen King, it's... You know, it's it's Pink Floyd. It's the stuff we love. It's the stuff we like. It's Big Trouble in Little China, The Thing, The Terror, etc., etc., etc. This is going. If we do it, this is going to be exactly the opposite. This is going to be exactly the opposite because that documentary is terrible. It is absolutely terrible. It's a really excellent example of a particular phenomena in media at the moment which is media apologizing for itself and for establishment that's what this documentary is for the most part it does this awful awful thing where it provides platform for the people who were contemporary not only contemporaries of Savile but people who were directly involved with him who certainly knew something was up who would have known something was going on who would have heard the rumors the stories and who did fuck all about it or even actively masked him who actively protected him and it gives them a platform to wring their hands and say oh well we couldn't possibly know oh well nobody knew did they fuck off i mean honestly fuck off we know for a fact people did know the stories the accusations the claims were all over the fucking place but nobody did anything about it because a he was protected by the establishment he was a darling of the tory party of the conservatives of the royal family of the establishment at the bbc and of various different charities and organizations across the face of the uk that nobody wanted to touch him he was too useful that's the truth of the matter they knew 
part, you know, there were certainly members of those organisations who knew what was going on. The fucking Tory party and the royal family, given what we've learned since, were probably directly involved. He probably had shit on, as much shit on them as they had on him, you know? So he would have almost certainly dragged some of them down with him if they ever attempted to, to finger him or attempted to actually bring him to task for his various abuses. But it gives them a platform to sort of wring their hands and say, oh, well, nobody could possibly know. It does this really fucking frustrating thing where it engages in what I would consider to be liberal apologia for the phenomena, for the atrocity. It basically tries to cast Savile as an anomaly, as an outlier from these systems, rather than as a feature of them, as a natural byproduct of them. And we know for a fact from the revelations that have come since and as a result of Savile's uh, disgrace that that's not true it's absolutely not true the abuses that Savile evinced are systemic and pervasive we know that for a fact Rolf Harris we know the entire the entirety of Operation Utree basically which was an investigation in the wake of Savile into abuses from show business personalities of young children of uh, prepubescent underage boys and girls um in in the show business culture basically and it revealed just scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal you know Rolf Harris is another good example. Prince Andrew, all of those involved with Epstein. The Tory paedophile ring, the Tory child abuse ring, which Theresa May quashed when she was Home Secretary and again when she became Prime Minister, right? We know for a fact that our media, our establishment, our politics is pervaded by these bastards. It, they operate within cultures where they are protected from any kind of recrimination or reprisal until after the fact, until long after the fact, until the weight of public knowledge and evidence makes it impossible to ignore. That's what happened with Savile. It's why he died before any kind of actual recrimination was brought to bear. It's disgusting. He was protected from on high, and he was protected from on high by systems that are innately abusive and which incorporate abuse as part and parcel of their process. That is what the documentary should have explored. The fact that he was a media darling, the fact that he was he was so densely personally involved with high-ranking members of the royal family and the Tory party. Margaret Thatcher was a close personal friend of his. She actually actively had the man around to her home any number of times. It's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. But to them, he was useful. He was useful because he exemplified the entire philosophy of neoliberalism, which, by the way, is innately abusive by its very nature. It incorporates abuse as part and parcel of its ideology. So, of course, he was perfect for them. He was absolutely perfect. This this attitude of let's not rely upon the state let's do things for ourselves let sort of wealthy successful quote-unquote people fix the ills of society you get savils that's what you fucking get people who utilize their power and their influence and the insularity that comes from their charitable works to do whatever the fuck they like right um, that, uh, abusers thrive in that kind of environment. Talk to anyone in care. Talk to anyone in care and they will tell you this because we are trained to spot them. We actually know what to look for. If you create systems where there are hierarchies, where there are people who are connected and have access to opportunity and are insulated from reprisal, you're gonna get abuse. You're gonna get abuse on a mass scale and that's what you got with Savile. I mean, Savile is one of the most prolific abusers in our nation's documented history and nothing was done. You are telling me that it's this hand-wringing bullshit that no, no journalist, no investigator knew this. You are telling me that. Bullshit. Bullshit. They knew. They knew. But as we know, as we know from the Epstein books, a lot of them who were around at the time were also probably abusers themselves. But this documentary gives these fuckers platform. And it does this, it has this overarching narrative and agenda to apologise for the systems and powers that be, for the establishment. It is an appalling 
appalling example of a documentary. It even hints occasionally, it even does suggest, it talks about the ties that Savile had to the Tory party, but it doesn't pursue it. It doesn't go after them. It doesn't analyse in any great degree what that means. Why someone like Savile was allowed to arise to be enshrined within public consciousness and discourse and yet nothing was done about it. The rumours, the stories, the accusations were widespread. A lot of his victims tried to bring him to task and were shouted down. He was also, you know, he was involved with the police as well. He was directly involved with police forces and no one wanted to do a damn thing. No one wanted to do a damn thing. I mean, also, misogyny plays a huge part. You have to bear in mind a lot of these accusations are occurring in the 60s, 70s and 80s. So, you know hysterical women women who just want who want to target him because he's famous who just want money you know that was that was the general excuse nothing nothing was done also bear in mind that even if he was taking advantage of and assaulting and raping women you can guarantee the cultures in police forces the patriarchal masculine cultures in police forces a lot of them would have been oh well so what you know who cares right that's what women are there for isn't it yeah you can guarantee that would have been part of the attitude. Um, but this documentary goes nowhere near that. It goes nowhere near tackling the culture that allowed Savile to arise. It even boasts the the uh, tagline, he groomed a nation. No, he fucking didn't. No, he fucking didn't. Loads of people knew what he was up to. Loads of people knew what he was like, but he was protected. He was defended from on high by the Prince of Darkness, insulated from all all reprisal by the circles in which he operated he managed somehow to wheedle his way into that particular magic circle that particular club and managed to integrate himself parasitically to such a degree that no one could do anything about him without making themselves a target in the process um because he would have obviously he would have exposed their abuses as well and some of those people are still around they're still in our public discourses i mentioned andrew neil before yes he was around at the time he was a journalist at the time for the odious rancid spectator as it was back then who quite frankly even if they did know probably would have wouldn't have cared and would have even apologized for him would had it come to light they would have targeted the victims given the nature of the spectator you know andrew neil who spent a significant part of his career in the 1980s writing articles about how aids is a gay disease and that it can't that straight people can't contract it well into the 90s that andrew neil that andrew neil uh yeah not letting that one go it gave platforms to people who were contemporaries and who likely were involved in very similar stuff that's the truth of the matter. And it did so in the name of insulating the powers and systems that be from reprisal. I, I thought it was disgusting. I thought the whole thing was absolutely rancid. Um, and an example of how you just don't do a documentary. This is how you don't make a documentary. You know, it's this, it's this thing we have in our news media in the UK about balance. We have this really odious, corrupt notion of what balance is. Like You see it in the BBC all the time, where they will get, if there's a certain issue under discussion, they will get two people on from either side, even when one side is categorically wrong or doesn't have any platform to be talking about it. So, like, it, it's the case where if you've got a debate about the flat Earth, about the, the Earth being flat, they'll get someone on who's like a cosmologist, who's a geophysicist, who's, who know, who's a, geo, uh, a geographer, who knows what they're fucking talking about, and then they'll get some internet weirdo who has no uh, no qualifications whatsoever, but who has an opinion on the matter, and they will call that balance. They will call that balance. You see, you saw the same with the COVID debate. You know, you got actual fucking virologists, epidemiologists, pandemiologists, nurses, doctors, people who know what the fuck they're talking about. And then some wacko, some some Internet educated fool who just has a strong opinion on the matter. And they call that balance. They call that balance, you know? We see it we see it everywhere. We see it in our in our daily discourses. We've got people like, for example, Richard Maidley, who's some nobody 
idiotic inbred twat, basically, who hosts a daytime discussion show, giving opinions on matters and arguing with experts who've done their fucking research, as though he has any fucking platform at all. As though he has any platform at all. He's an ignoramus. He just happens to have the platform. That's all. And we see that all the time. We see it in our politics. We see it in our politics. We've got people like Nigel Farage, who knows nothing about anything, but who is invited to give opinions on fucking everything, as though he is a uh, some sort of authority. We see it all the fucking time. And we, we tend, because we love people who justify us in our ignorance, there is this horrible tendency for us to enshrine and hoist the ignorami above the people who give the, the true answers, who have the true knowledge, because the truth is often way more complex than these talking heads with their particular agendas and their biases and their simplistic manipulations are willing to give right? People love to have an easy answer. So with, with Savile, it was, it was him. He is just an evil, twisted man, right? No, sorry, it's not that simple. Savile was a product of numerous influences, which the documentary just, just, just sort of like mm, hints at, but never goes into. Like his hideous relationship with his mother, for example. He had a really twisted, strange overly obsessive relationship with his mother who was clearly abusive you know in many 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 ways um that's not the be all and end all but obviously it's an influence it's something that needs to be discussed um his the fact that he had opportunity that he was in a place where he could do exactly what he liked and he knew he could do what he liked because nobody would ever take him to task rolf harris was the same in that regard another prominent abuser from children's television in the uk who actually i grew up watching you know rolf harris was um a name for the longest time again close connections with the queen with the royal family with certain members of politics very influential in the bbc and itv and and news networks um he was an establishment figure he was well beloved as well he masked himself very well but once again there are documentaries out there that talk about how he was well known for being an abusive asshole to particularly to women his conduct towards women was disgusting proprietal objectifying he would touch people without being asked he would hug people without being asked he would make lecherous suggestions completely apart from his personal personality when he was he was putting on his face you know when he was when he was in Rolf's cartoon club for example which I watched when I was a kid in the 1980s he was really avuncular he was really interesting and knowledgeable and fun for children to watch but he was an evil bastard he was a an abuser behind the scenes and people knew institutions knew complaints had been made to police to investigators to employers and nobody did anything because, once again, he was in a position of power. He was within these systems and cycles which protect and promote abuse as part and parcel. The only time they do anything is when they are categorically caught out, when they can't ignore it anymore. It's exactly the same thing that we see with churches. And I'm sorry, there isn't a church in existence that's free of this. There just isn't. No matter how big, no matter how small, there isn't a church structure or religious structure that is free of this because by their very nature, they have these hierarchical systems that insulate particular individuals. And some of them, like the Mormon church like the jehovah's witness church like certain extreme catholic communities and evangelical communities because they foster secrecy by their very nature because they foster these insular cultures abuse is rife it is absolutely rife i mean the the elders of the Jehovah's Witness and Mormon Church, they're untouchable. By and large, they're untouchable because the communities will not do anything against them. They are terrified of doing anything against them because the social reprisals are so extreme. It is essentially exile. If you like if you cause ruction in that community, you're out. Which is why abuse, particularly of young girls and young boys in those communities, is rife. It is absolutely endemic to those communities. And we know that. 
that. Everybody knows that. But again, because they're powerful, they're moneyed, because there is this structure around them protecting them, nobody will do anything about it. There have never been any serious investigations. The only investigations have come out from outside. They've come from people, and often not from police, not from like systemic official investigators, but they come from individuals. Individuals who are often parts of those churches, who were were exiled, who were victims. I've seen it. I've seen it myself. I'm a carer, right? I used to work with a young guy who was part of the uh, the Jehovah's Witness Church. He were and yeah, he was abused many, many times. And what happened? The church closed ranks around him. I know where the primary abuser is. I know where he lives. You know, but I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it because there's nothing, there's no evidence, there's nothing, there's not even accusations anymore, unfortunately. But I know it happened. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, I tried. I tried when I was working with the young man, but the community, the culture closed ranks around the abuser and exiled the victim because that's what they do. Protecting the establishment, protecting the hierarchy and the culture is more important than protecting the individuals within it. Especially if those individuals are disposable anyway, like if they're disabled or if they're young or if they if they turn out to be gay, for example. So these, I'm sorry, but these structures, it doesn't matter if they are religious. It just happens that religious structures are particularly prone to this corruption. Um, it is everywhere. I'm really sorry. It is everywhere. And if you if you happen to be part of those structures or if you happen to operate within them, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. Look for certain things. Look for people. If you want to look for the people who are abusers, this is what you need to look for. Because, again, we're trained in it. We know what to look for. Look for the people who are holier than thou. Look for the people who are really who won't go anywhere unless they're really smartly dressed, who have this very upright, very strict notion of what morality is, who, who, who advertise themselves as being very stentorian and very buttoned down because there's repression there. And there is this, if they are very intent upon you, perceiving them in a particular way, it's so often, almost universally, it's a mask. Almost universally, it's a mask. And if they need the mask, then you have to ask yourselves why right? You want to look for the people who nobody has a bad word to say about. That's what you want to look for. Those people who, you know, those people who in local neighborhoods, they say things like, oh, aren't they nice? They would do anything for anyone. They do anything for people in their local community. You kind of want to look for that. Not, It's not the case. It's not, you know, be very careful about it because you need to be very, very careful. You need to be very aware of these things. It may just be they're just nice people and they will do anything for anyone. But abusers, narcissists do this thing where they try to create a public persona. They try to create a mask for themselves that shrouds them and insulates them against reprisal so that when the accusations come, people turn on the victims. They say something like, oh, they wouldn't do that. Oh, you, they, there's no way they'd do that. You're just, you're just doing this because of this. That's what they do. That's the way they operate. And they are the people you want to watch, particularly those who are in positions where they're insulated anyway. So your elders, your priests, your people who are in those positions, basically, who are in those in positions of authority within those systems. That's what you want to watch. And the people who seek those positions out, who actively seek those positions out, that's what you want to look for because they appeal to narcissists. They appeal to people who are abusive by nature. And yeah, the documentary goes nowhere near this. Nowhere near this. It is intent on casting Savile himself as an outlier instead of uh, a symptom of a wider disease. And that is my real issue with it.